We noted uh, that Jesus was drawing these large crowds uh, at one point uh, when he fed the 4,000. Uh, the people had been there for three days to listen to him. And the pastor made a good point to me after that Jesus was also healing people. So it wasn't just that he was a dynamic teacher. Uh, you know, you'd probably hang out indefinitely if you were lame or something and you wanted to walk again. So uh, there was that influence there, certainly, in the people staying so long. But they had stayed to listen to him uh, so long that Jesus was concerned they would faint on their way home. We noted that uh, Jesus would use sharp contrasts and some colorful expressions in his teaching. One example we looked at was in John 8, when he called the Pharisees slaves and children of Satan, and he contrasted them uh, and this idea of being slave to sin with the freedom uh, that comes with being a child of God. Next, we pointed out how Jesus taught with the authority of God, uh, which set him apart from other teachers like the scribes. We read in Mark 1.22, where the people in the synagogue were astonished that clearly recognizing a difference between Jesus' teaching and the scribes that they were used to. Additionally, in terms of Jesus' authority, uh, we read in his Sermon on the Mount how he elaborated on commandments that were found in the Old Testament, uh, adding instruction uh, that requires <coughs> obedience of thought and not just of action. Which, which shows that he has authority even over the scriptures. Uh, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, 15, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity <coughs> every thought to the obedience of Christ. And this is where Christ begins teaching at the Sermon on the Mount, that even our thoughts ought to be subject to the Lord. Third, we noted how Jesus used parables that helped to explain spiritual truths using, using everyday examples. For example, we looked at Jesus' instructions for Christians to be salt and light. Both of these are common everyday <coughs> things that illustrate the role of the Christian in preserving the world through the spread of godliness, just as salt preserves food and in showing the world, world God's truth by bringing understanding to the people of the world, the way that light helps us to understand the world around us through illumination. So these are the first features we looked at. The next feature of Jesus' teaching we will highlight is Jesus' use of the scriptures to support his points. One of the benefits of studying Jesus' methods here is so that we can imitate him when we're teaching others, when we are uh, engaged in a, a theological discussion. We, too, can use the Bible to support our points uh, when sharing the gospel or teaching in general. As Christians, we have a wonderful advantage, and, you know, the world will look at it and say that we are ignorant sometimes because we believe what is written in the Bible. But we have an advantage over every other ideology there is because the Bible gives us absolute instruction here. Uh, if you are familiar enough with your Bible, you can have some degree of discernment on, on most topics, and uh, you can have absolute authority on moral issues. Um, in debate, intelligent people can argue effectively with using logic or philosophy or anecdotes or other forms of abstract support. Uh, each of these does have merit, you know, using examples and logic. But as believers, when the Bible is decisive on a topic, uh, for us, the debate is over once the Bible has, has declared something to be a certain way. Um, and then we can start from that biblical truth, and 100% of the time, our natural observations are going to support that truth. The same way the world will assume 
things like the age of the earth, or they just assume, they'll start from their ideology that's supported by you know, conjecture or bad science or what have you, philosophy. Ours, we can start from the assumption that the Bible is true, as we do as Christians, and then our observations are going to support that 100% of the time. Um, when someone produces evidence that's contrary to what we find in the Bible, we know there's something wrong with their evidence. Some, some piece of their argument is false or uh, otherwise incorrect. Let's look at an example of Jesus using scriptures to teach. <coughs> We're going to turn to Matthew 22, 23 through 29 to start. Matthew 22, 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection... Whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Who is Jesus debating here? The Sadducees. The Sadducees, absolutely. And what is their debate concerning? The resurrection. The resurrection, absolutely. The Sadducees, of course, think they have found an example. They, what they have here, did this actually happen? Was there a man, uh, you know, were there seven uh, men who married the same wife uh, and followed the, you know, the Old Testament law? That way, the, you know, in, in Old Testament times, it would be a really big deal if your husband died because that he was the one working. So they developed this law, you know, the Bible gives this law so that these women in the Old Testament time would be cared for because they're, they don't have a, a way of income. And if some tragedy struck and he lost their husband, it wasn't like you could just go out and pick up a new husband uh, or, you know, you couldn't just go out and get a job and support yourself and have a home. So this law was put in place to protect these widows. Uh, and that's what they're citing here, but they made this up. There is no, there is no woman who was married to seven men. Th this, this scenario didn't play out this many times. What the Sadducees have done here is they cooked up a crazy example to disprove Jesus. That's what, that's what their plan is. They, they build this false scenario thinking, oh, what will Jesus say to this? He won't be able to prove that there's a, an afterlife, that there's a resurrection, because would this be an awkward situation if <clears throat> life in the resurrection is, is the same as life is now? Would that be a little awkward? Yeah. yeah. I don't think it would be a very pleasant situation to have to be married to your spouse along with seven other people or six other people for eternity. It would be a little weird. Uh, and so that's what they do. They cook up this scheme. They think they've got Jesus. But if you were really, is it a legitimate question to wonder about, about what happens in the resurrection, about what happens in the afterlife? Sure. Sure. I, before I learned, you know, more about this passage here, I wondered this, you know, especially as a young husband thinking, boy, I, I want to spend eternity with my wife, my beloved wife, you know, not understanding how things work. You know, you do wonder about heaven. How will our relationships be with our spouses when we're in heaven? That's a legitimate question, but you wouldn't ask in this manner. You would say, Master, you know, I love my wife. How will our relationship be in heaven? And then Jesus would probably give a nice example and explain. Uh, but that's not what they're going for here. They're being sneaky and nasty. You know, 
Master, oh, tell us, do tell us, what will happen to this man? I heard about this man. They made it up. They cooked the whole thing up to trick Jesus. And Jesus is not tricked. So the Sadducees developed this absurd hypothetical in an effort to trap Jesus. Have you ever had someone do this to you? Yes, what are some examples of this absurd hypotheticals that people use to trip us up? Why would a good, loving God send anyone to hell? Yes, that's a great example. Great example. I, I, had, uh, I had someone tell me, well, what about, you know, what about the monk that sits in his temple over in, China, and he is very devout, following his Buddhist religion, and he never did wrong to anybody. Are you telling me this person uh, is going to hell? Well, they've already built this fake premise, like as you said, that there's this good person. How many good people do you know? None of us are good. And this same monk probably has plenty of things that are wrong with him, just like everybody else. Uh, the example that came right away to my mind is, is abortion. I mean, that, that's the best. A generation of people have been slain uh, because of the anecdote of this woman who has been raped and now becomes pregnant during this rape and has to bear the child of her rapist. And it was all a lie. It was that, a it, same as what the Pharisees are doing. They cook up this scenario that never happened or almost never happened that there's a saying the uh, the exception proves the rule you know that this doesn't happen or it so rarely happens that it proves the fact that that you know abortion should not be in any case so let's see how Jesus responds Matthew 22 29 through 33. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. First point that I'd like to make is that Jesus reveals a detail about what life will be like in heaven. Who can do this? Only somebody who's been there. Exactly. Only God. This isn't a quote from the Old Testament where it describes what heaven will be like. Jesus, as God, is revealing a detail about what heaven is like. Once again, we see that supreme authority, the authority of God, revealed here. Uh, the Sadducees assume that people who believe in the resurrection also believe that life after the resurrection will be similar to the life we have now. Is this unreasonable? Like, I think sometimes we do this too, right? Don't we have some assumptions about what heaven will be like? We don't really know, but we have some ideas. You know, some things have been revealed to us in God's scripture, but not, not everything about heaven. And the Sadducees are making assumptions about what heaven will be like here. One other thing is I'd like to point out in verse 31, Jesus says, that which was spoken to you by God. This is how Jesus describes the scriptures here, that the Old Testament scriptures were written to these people. So this is how Jesus describes the Bible. So this, the Bible, as we know, is written to us, but we can see it confirmed in Jesus' words here. Let's turn 
to Exodus 3, 1 through 6. And we can see these verses that Jesus quotes here. Exodus 3, 1 through 6. One other thing to point out is that I think somebody had said, somebody had said uh, when we were discussing the book of Isaiah, how Jews didn't accept the book of Isaiah, uh, which was an excellent point. Jesus makes a point here to quote a portion of the Old Testament that the Sadducees do believe in. Uh, the book of Exodus would have been part of the scriptures that the Sadducees believed. And he quotes it to support his point about the resurrection. Now, when Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him of the midst of the bush, out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. God's words are specific here to Moses. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Not, I was the God of your father. I am the God of your father. Uh, actually, I wanted to point out, in my Bible, uh, it gives some further explanation of this term, I am. The, so, in the English language, we have uh, these uh, articles, like is, am, is, are, was, were, be, being, been, and they have kind of a simple sort of meaning in English. They're just... Uh, indicating a state of being. But to the Hebrew, at least according to my uh, subnotes here in my study Bible, to the Hebrew, to be does not just mean to exist, but to be active, to express oneself in active being. And that's what God is saying here. I am the God of these people. And keep in mind, there were 430 years between Abraham and Moses. Abraham has been dead a long time. But Abraham is not dead. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all alive. They're not on earth anymore. But God is still their God, and they still exist where they're at. So... God's assertion in Exodus is that he is the God of these Jewish patriarchs, which is evidence of the resurrection because God himself refers to them in a manner that assumes their continued existence. Does this argument work for Jesus? It does, because then we read on, but when the Pharisees, verse 34, actually let's start in 33 and 34, uh, Matthew 22, 33. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered together. Jesus' argument works. The Sadducees are stumped because they recognize the truth in Jesus' quote from the Old Testament, and they can't argue against it. How could we use the scriptures to debate the argument that a victim of rape should be able to have an abortion to save her from the grief of bringing her rapist child to term? We can't. Oh, how can we use it to, to bring the child to term? Well, how can we use it to argue against this point? Because one of our biggest problems, I think, in terms of the abortion debate is that there are a lot of Christians 
who think that this is an acceptable exception. Uh, you know, certainly not ones that have searched it out well in the scriptures, but there are a lot of people that are good people that fall on this side. That this should this should be an exception because of the difficulty of the, the scenario. Yes? I personally would point out the book of Genesis that says that mankind was created in the image of God. Excellent example. Excellent example. Yes? Yes, Teresa. Somewhere in Psalms, I can't remember where, where David actually said, you did me together in my mother's womb. There is in this right there. Excellent example. And remember, the Sadducees believe the Old Testament. Jesus quotes the Old Testament because they believe it. And then they're put to silence. The other Christians need to hear these truths in the Bible. They maybe don't read through that passage in Psalms. There's also... There's also the Ten Commandments that say, Thou shalt not kill. That's why they call it the law of tissue. Another great example. Yes, Lee. What's the punishment for rape? Is it murder? The now, see that. Child. That's a good logical argument against it. That's true. Is it right to kill somebody? Or, now, granted, some of us would say, well, of course, some kill the rapist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but. So institute that. I mean, if you're going to institute one, institute the other. Yes. Plus, um, the Bible says in Jeremiah, again, Old Testament, that, I mean, God has a plan. No matter what the life or how that baby was conceived, God has a purpose for that baby. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is a case where anecdotes are great, too, because there are plenty of babies. Yes. It just <clears throat> goes to show you, though, how there is no logic. We can hate it in Scripture. We can hate it all day long. But when it comes to abortion, there is no logic. Because is it the state of California now that has passed the law because they can't abort the baby up until the time of birth and let the baby die? But if you are a mother that murders that baby, So murder isn't murder in that case. Correct. Well, and this is why I pose the question in this way, because really the argument, you know, is for the Christian who doesn't support the idea that abortion should not be allowed at all. And that's what happened in California. Mm -hmm. There were enough Christians in California to vote that down, and they should have, but they don't <clears throat> understand the scriptures, so they chose to ignore it because of they were swayed by other arguments that, you know, swayed by emotion. It is a terrible scenario that almost never, ever occurs, but they don't think beyond that point. They say, well, this individual under this very rare specific situation must have the right to do it, and so millions must die to support this idea. But they don't, like you said, they don't look at the logic of that. Um, some people brought up some excellent verses. I'm just going to cite a few that could be used in this uh, in this discussion with Christians. And this is where the debate is. When there's a woman at the abortion clinic, I think the best methods, uh, you know, and you guys are there a lot, but I think the uh, the ultrasound is a great Amen. way to, to show these women and obviously showing them support. You know, the scariest thing, especially if you were a single mother, I would think that you would be afraid to, to have a baby because of the financial aspects and, and these people at the abortion clinic are there to support the mother. If you don't have a family, it's hard to, to take care of a baby. Um, and I think these, you know, you have to listen to the Holy Spirit if you ever get into an actual discussion with a woman considering uh, abortion. And maybe some of these arguments that I'm gonna mention in the scriptures might not be the best way to approach them 
But our Christian peers, I think some of these examples are great examples, kind of like Jesus used these examples to other Bible believers. The Sadducees obviously weren't Christians, but they did believe the book of Exodus, which he uses against them. And hopefully we can use some of these verses against Christians which fall on that side of the abortion topic. Uh, Jeremiah 1.5 is a great example. establishes personhood before we are formed. When someone says, as somebody mentioned, it's just a cluster of cells, we're all clusters of cells Amen. with a soul. And here, God establishes this personhood as a person's being formed in the belly. Not once they turn, you know, once they resemble a baby or once their heart is beating, when they are being formed, God establishes this person. Uh, Psalms, and we know that God knows us from eternity. Before we ever even exist earthly, God knows us. We look at Psalm 139. Verse 13 through 16. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my other, in my mother's womb, womb. Um, I just like to point out this term "possess my brains" uh, means formed my inward parts. So your guts, your muscles, your what's inside. That's what it means to possess your brains. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So this is what it's talking about. This same cluster of cell argument that's so often used, this is what God's talking about. That when you are a cluster of cells, I am, you know, I am forming you, and you exist. Your, your soul is there. You're not just yeah. meat. You are a person at this stage in your development. You formed my inward parts. God sees our bodies before they are formed. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 <coughs> These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. There is no more innocent blood to shed than that of a child. And when a person gets together with murderers to plot the murder of their own child, there's just about no more wicked thing a person can do. Uh, and that's what, they're, that's what they're doing. This topic of abortion involves a lot of euphemisms that people use, and a lot of times by just declaring exactly what they are, you've won an argument. Or you, you've made an excellent point. Kind of like when Jesus, uh, last week we were reading about how Jesus said, you're trying to kill me, to, to the people he was arguing with. He called them murderers in his argument. He was very direct, and he pointed out a truth. And those people the, that he was arguing with knew they wanted to kill him. And he pointed it out, and it was true. These people that are meeting with doctors, to decide how to get rid of their baby, to decide what the best way to get rid of their baby, 
are hands that shed innocent blood. And it's a great wickedness. Yes, Andy? One of the common arguments that I hear, and I don't even know how to counter that argument, is that the baby has been developed with a birth defect and the mother was not wanting to see the child suffer the effects of that birth defect. So this, that's why they decided to terminate. This is another... You know, Down syndrome, spina bifida, whatever. This is another example that's very much like what the Sadducees brought to Jesus. What, a, what about uh, a, a woman who was married to seven different men in the afterlife? You know, they bring up this very specific scenario that almost never occurs. And we can't, we can't actually, through ultrasound and stuff like that, determine that a child is going to be born with Downs or missing. Well, what they or, don't tell you or, about that. You know, is that or science is. <laughs> that science is not absolute. They're not it's not like they pulled the the baby out of there, took a look at him, did an examination. That science is not absolute. It happens all the time where somebody has surprise twins. Oh, oh my goodness, you had two babies. We just missed the heartbeat. You're telling me that they can tell exactly the, the deformation that a baby has inside the womb at six weeks or eight weeks or whatever, when they can't even tell that there's two babies inside there some of the time? There's a lot of bad science that goes into the arguments that these people use. Yes? Not just bad science, though, but we have to realize and understand that maybe that child or that baby does have Down syndrome or has spina bifida or some other incurable genetic disorder. But God knows. Yeah. And God gave that baby life for a purpose. And I know couples that their babies have been born and they've been born and they've only lived minutes. But that was profound and that is part of God's plan. It's not us That's another good circumstance where you use the correct language and, you know, but point out what they're talking about. They're meeting with their murderous doctor uh, to discuss whether or not their child with Down syndrome or spina bifida deserves to live right. and how best to murder it. Yes? I had a doctor ask me for my last baby because I was older. If I wanted to do these tests as early as possible because these things were all possible and I said, I'm not going to do those tests at all. They mean nothing to me and they won't pertain to for anything anyway. So I refused it, but I was up to it because I already had a handicapped child and they felt like this was something that, and I just refused to do the test at all because I said it would have no benefit to me or my future child. To, I can't see any benefit in that. Sure, it'll just make you anxious. Yeah, but they wanted to do it. Oh, yeah. Well, because they, is there a motivation there for these doctors? Absolutely. They make money off of this. Oh, yeah. They make a lot of money off of this. Um, so, the point here is we have to know what the scriptures say, and we have to be able to, you know, we should probably memorize some of these passages where they're located. And then when we have these discussions with our peers, our fellow Christians, and say, hey, listen, why I understand you want, you feel like there should be this exception available here, but the Bible calls it murder. You know, it, you know and we, we use these terms, we don't use the euphemisms that the world likes to use, you know, like a cluster of cells or, or choice some of these other things, you call it out as it is, and you help to use your arguments uh, to support your arguments with what the Bible actually says. And when the Bible is direct on something, that there is no more debate. You know, that the debate is over. It's only a matter of bringing them over to our side. You know, you know the truth. 
And the truth is, thou shalt not kill. Period. There's no exception to that. You're, you're not supposed to do it. So, memorizing these passages, the way Jesus, Jesus knew what Exodus said. Jesus knew the exact way that God referred to uh, these fathers of, of Israel, uh, these patriarchs, and he brought it up. He had it ready in this discussion right away. They cooked up, these Sadducees got together and they cooked up this great scenario. We're going to get him. And what is he going to say to this? We've had this happen before. Uh, well, and sometimes it's just to try to put us to scorn, where someone will say, well, who is uh, who was Cain's wife? How about that? God's okay with uh, incest? Is this good? You know, and they do it to be snide. They don't understand the science. They don't understand the history. But there are a lot of things like that, where they'll find some little scenario where it doesn't work, just like what happened to Jesus, and then all we have to do is use the Bible to support the evidence against what they're saying. And you know what? Then they'll be silent, just like the Sadducees were silent. <clears throat> I got a good one, Mike. Somebody once asked me, if God is all-knowing, why did he create the devil? Why did he create the devil? Yeah, these are weird questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and sometimes they can suffer if you're not studied out. Yes? He created Satan, but he also created volition. And that's where Satan fell. Oh, free will. Free will. Free right. Without free will, he, God didn't want robots, yeah. or he would have created robots. He wants, you can only love somebody by choice. It is your choice. And God wants us to choose Well, and these are certainly sometimes, I think abortion is an easy one for us because it, you know, it's very cut and dry, murder and not murder. You know, free will is a much more difficult topic to understand and it causes a lot of people to, you know, to have, you know, question their faith sometimes. And, you know, that's why it's so important to search out these verses, search out what the Bible actually says about these topics so that not just so that we can support our arguments with others, but in the event that something happens in your life where you have a crisis of faith and you have doubts, you want to support them with the knowledge that's been provided to us uh, in God's word. Can I just say one more thing? Please. Um, we have to remember, is a church, is a church that, and I don't know off the top of my head statistically how many women there are even within the church that have chosen abortion over choosing life. So we as a church family have to remember to love them still and not to judge them and to say, you know, it's amazing how in the church how we can hurt each other, you know, by just the words that we say. So we have to remember to love them because maybe they chose an abortion before they became a believer chose abortion for whatever reason after. We still have to remember to love these women because their sin is no greater than ours. Amen. Well, and, and that, I think that's a weakness in general that people have uh, where a sin that, you know, obviously I'm never going to be tempted to having an abortion. Right. You know, the, you know, when you have an issue that, you know, that of sin that you just don't struggle with, whether because you can't struggle with it or because you just were made in a way that it's not something that troubles you. It's easy for us to be a lot more judgmental on, on people that exhibit these sins. I think another example would be like a homosexual, right. you know, very easy to say, you know, this is what the wickedness in this world. It's all coming from them, you know, because the, we don't have that problem. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, but at the same time, we can't, right. you know, we can't ignore what the Bible does say. Right. When, you know, and, and I think that a woman who has had an abortion would want to understand this. I think that as she repented of that sin, she would say, boy, I, you know, looking back at it, especially, you would see the evil of the whole thing. The way, you know, uh, the way you were kind of coaxed into the idea. You know, they tried to funnel you into an abortion before 
you, you ever even knew, probably if you were having a boy or a girl. Uh, you know, so obviously there are these evil people that are trying to draw people into abortion, and, and these poor women are, the, all, the whole way they're trying to be pushed into that lane. So absolutely, you want to be compassionate on the person that has done it, but ideally that person would be the strongest advocate against it right. after the fact. And you'd look back on it and say, man, that was evil. The way we all sat together and plotted out the death of my baby. Uh, terrible. There's but, a, good point, yes. There was a ministry in Providence that, that I was introduced to at a youth Christian ladies meeting that I was at one time where they worked with these women who had been wounded in the church who did make the choice or whatever point in their life to have an abortion and the way they were treated. Uh, again, because things will be said blanket statements in a group of people and we don't realize, nobody, no, nobody knows the history of everybody sitting in this room. We all have a history, we have a past, we have baggage, we have whatever, and we need to be cognizant, all of us, and I'm guilty of not, of saying things in a setting where I shouldn't have said them. And it, you know, it's just, that's common to us, but that's in the flesh, but we need to try to be in the spirit when we're in a group setting and realize we don't know everyone's history. Be cognizant of that. It is tough. I think we have a tendency to think everyone else here is like-minded too, and there is nuance. They can slip. <laughs> I think that's why the Apostle Paul wrote, and such were some of you. Well, uh, thank you all for participating in that discussion there. Some great points were brought up. And next week we'll get more. I think we'll finish Jesus' debate here because he uh, uh, he continues and ends up having a debate with a lawyer afterwards who also tries to trip him up in a slightly different way. So we'll look at that and then we'll look at some more of Jesus' techniques when giving instruction.